How's that again? Presence. The truth about Moai. Moai are monolithic human figures carved by the Rapa Nui people on Easter Island, Rapa Nui, in eastern Polynesia between the years 1250 and 1500. Nearly half are still at Reino Reraku, the main Moai quarry, but hundreds were transported from there and set on stone platforms called Ohu around the island's perimeter. Almost all Moai have overly large heads, which comprise three-eighths the size of the whole statue, which has no legs. The Moai are chiefly the living faces, Aringaora of deified ancestors, Aringaora of Tete Punno. The statues still gazed inland across their clan lands when Europeans first visited the island in 1722, but all of them had fallen by the latter part of the 19th century. The Moai were toppled in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, possibly as a result of European contact or in turn the seen tribal wars. The production and transportation of the more than 900 statues is considered a remarkable creative and physical feat. The tallest Moai erected, called Paro, was almost 10 meters, 33 feet, high and weighed 82 metric tons, 80.7 tons. The heaviest Moai erected was a shorter but squatter Moai at Ahu Tagariki, weighing 86 metric tons, 84.6 tons. One unfinished sculpture, if completed, would be approximately 21 meters, 69 feet, tall, with a weight of about 145 to 165 tons. The statues were carved by the Polynesian colonizers of the island, mostly between 1250 and 1500, in addition to representing deceased ancestors, the Moai, once they were erected on Ahu, may also have been regarded as the embodiment of powerful living or former chiefs and important lineage status symbols. Each Moai presented a status. The larger the statue placed upon an Ahu, the more mana the chief who commissioned it had. The competition for grandest statue was ever prevalent in the culture of the Easter Islanders. The proof stems from the varying sizes of Moai. Completed statues were moved to Ahu mostly on the coast, then erected, sometimes with Pukeo, red stone cylinders, on their heads. Moai must have been extremely expensive to craft and transport, not only would the actual carving of each statue require effort and resources, but the finished product was then hauled to its final location and erected. The quarries in Reino Reraku appear to have been abandoned abruptly, with a litter of stone tools and many completed Moai outside the quarry awaiting transport and almost as many incomplete statues still in situ as were installed on Ahu. In the 19th century, this led to conjecture that the island was the remnant of a sunken continent and that most completed Moai were under the sea. That idea has long been debunked, and now it is understood that some statues were rock carvings and never intended to be completed. Some were incomplete because, when inclusions were encountered, the carvers would abandon a partial statue and start a new one. Tough is a soft rock with occasional lumps of much harder rock included in it. Some completed statues at Reino Reraku were placed there permanently and not parked temporarily awaiting removal. Some were indeed incomplete when the statue building air came to an end. It is not known exactly which group in the communities were responsible for carving statues. Oral traditions suggest that the Moai were carved either by a distinguished class of professional carvers who were comparable in status to high-ranking members of other Polynesian craft guilds, or, alternatively, by members of each clan. The oral histories show that the Reino Reraku quarry was subdivided into different territories for each clan. Since the island was largely treeless by the time the Europeans first visited, the movement of the statues was a mystery for a long time. Pollen analysis has now established that the island was almost totally forested until 1200 C. The tree pollen disappeared from the record by 1650. It is not known exactly how the Moai were moved across the island. Earlier researchers assumed that the process almost certainly required human energy, ropes, and possibly wooden sledges, sleds, and, or, rollers, as well as leveled tracks across the island, the Easter Island roads. Another theory suggests that the Moai were placed on top of logs and were rolled to their destinations. If that theory is correct it would take 50 to 150 people to move the Moai. The most recent study demonstrates from the evidence in the archaeological record that the statues were harnessed with ropes from two sides and made to walk, by tilting them from side to side while pulling forward. They would also use a chant, whilst walking, the Moai. Coordination and cohesion were essential, so they developed a chant in which the rhythm helped them pull at the precise moment necessary. 
Oral histories recount how various people used divine power to command the statues to walk. The earliest accounts say a king named Tukuye who moved them with the help of the god Maki Maki, while later stories tell of the woman who lived alone on the mountain ordering them about at her will. Scholars currently support the theory that the main method was that the Moai were walked upright, some assumed by a rocking process, as laying it prone on the sledge. The method used by the Easter Islanders to move stone in the 1860s would have required an estimated 1,500 people to move the largest Moai that had been successfully erected. In 1998, Joanne Van Tilburg suggested fewer than half that number could do it by placing the sledge on lubricated rollers. In 1999, she supervised an experiment to move a 9 metric ton moai. The replica was loaded on the sledge built in the shape of an A frame that was placed on rollers and 60 people pulled on several ropes in two attempts to tow the moai. The first attempt failed when the rollers jammed up. The second attempt succeeded when tracks were embedded in the ground. This was on flat ground and used eucalyptus wood rather than the native palm trees. In 1986, Pavel Pavel, Thor Heyerdahl, and the Kontiki Museum experimented with a 5 metric ton moai and a 9 metric ton moai, with a rope around the head of the statue and another around the base, using 8 workers for the smaller statue and 16 for the larger. They walked the moai forward by swiveling and rocking it from side to side, however, the experiment was ended early due to damage to the statue bases from chipping. Despite the early end to the experiment, Thor Heyerdahl estimated that this method for a 20 metric ton statue over Easter Island terrain would allow 320 feet 100 meters, per day. Other scholars concluded that it was probably not the way the Moai were moved due to the reported damage to the base caused by the shuffling motion. Around the same time, archaeologist Charles Love experimented with a 10 metric ton replica. His first experiment found rocking the statue to walk it was too unstable over more than a few hundred yards. He then found that placing the statue upright onto sled runners atop log rollers, 25 men were able to move the statue 150 feet, 46 meters, in two minutes. In 2003, further research indicated this method could explain supposedly regularly spaced post holes. His research on this claim has not yet been published, where the statues were moved over rough ground. He suggested the holes contained upright posts on either side of the path so that as the statue passed between them, they were used as cantilevers for poles to help push a statue up a slope without the requirement of extra people pulling on the ropes and similarly to slow it on the downward slope. The poles could also act as a brake when needed. Based on detailed studies of the statues found along prehistoric roads, archaeologists Terry Hunt and Carl Lipo have shown that the pattern of breakage, form and position of statues is consistent with an upright hypothesis for transportation. Hunt and Lipo argue that when the statues were carved at a quarry, the sculptors left their bases wide and curved along the front edge. They showed that statues along the road have a center of mass that causes the statue to lean forward. As the statue tilts forward, it rocks sideways along its curved front edge and takes a step. Large flakes are seen broken off of the sides of the bases. They argue that once the statue was walked down the road and installed in the landscape, the wide and curved base was carved down. All of this evidence points to an upright transportation practice. Recent experimental recreations have proven that it is fully possible that the Moai were literally walked from their quarries to their final positions by ingenious use of ropes. Teams of workers would have worked to rock the Moai back and forth, creating the walking motion and holding the Moai upright. If correct, it can be inferred that the fallen road Moai were the result of the teams of balancers being unable to keep the statue upright, and it was presumably not possible to lift the statues again once knocked over. However, the debate continues. At some point after the 1722 Jacob Rogavine arrival, all of the Moai that had been erected on Ahu were toppled, with the last standing statues reported in 1838 by Abel Oderk Pet Ethers, and no upright statues by 1868, apart from the partially buried ones on the outer slopes of Rono Raroku. Oral histories include one account of a clan pushing down a single Moai in the night, but others refer to the earth shaking, and there are indications that at least some of them fell down due to earthquakes. Some of the Moai toppled forward such that their faces were hidden, and often fell in such a way that their necks broke, others fell off of the back of their platforms. To date, about 50 Moai have been re-erected on their Ahuzora museums elsewhere.
The raw Inuit people were then devastated by the slave trade that began at the island in 1862. Within a year, the individuals that remained on the island were sick, injured, and lacking leadership. The survivors of the slave raids had new company from landing missionaries. Over time, the remaining populace converted to Christianity. Slowly, native Easter Islanders began to be assimilated, as their tattoos and body paint were banned by the new Christian proscriptions, after which they were then subjected to removal from a portion of their native lands and made to reside on the much smaller portion of the island, while the rest was used for farming by the Peruvians.